Welcome to yet another MCAT passage breakdown. Today we're going to be going over the AMC sample test psychsoc passage number six. We should be going over some examples of conditioning so you'll finally understand that one episode of The Office. But that's enough intro, let's go ahead and look at the passage. Like always, I'm just going to read the passage and flow chart it out, tell you my main thoughts, basic sciences, relationships, and then we're going to jump into the questions and I'm going to walk you through answering every single one of those. This passage is a short one, and it starts off by saying, as Jay is on his way to work in a crowded subway car, which is kind of a weird preference for an MCAT passage. But anyways, Jay's on his way to work in a crowded subway car. The train comes to a sudden halt, and all the lights go off. Many passengers lose their balance, and people start screaming. Okay, do you notice how they're setting up this like weird situation? Okay, they're either going to ask, what is like the phenomena that's causing all these people to freak out or how is Jay feeling during the event? And you kind of notice that just from the fact that it, they are telling a little bit of a story and we're in the psych -so section. Within the commotion, several people stumble over Jay. He experiences intense fear, his heart begins to pound, he feels short of breath, and he begins to perspire. Jay is all sweaty. So Jay's freaking out, right? They're about to ask why. After this event, Jay experiences physiological and emotional arousal whenever he is in a confined environment. Environment. Ah, okay, so now he is starting to experience some of the same symptoms that he had in that subway car. Okay, that sounds like a little bit of conditioning, doesn't it? Whenever he is in a confined environment, he becomes unwilling to leave home because he feels that it is impossible for him to avoid confined spaces. He begins to eat sunblock. Oh wait, no, that was a movie. To eliminate Jay's fear reaction, his therapist repeatedly places him in confined spaces. A little bit of exposure therapy here. So I'm gonna make a note of that. I'm also gonna go back and make a little note that we are looking at some conditioning, even though they didn't explicitly state it. So his therapist is torturing him. Um, this causes Jay to experience intense discomfort initially, but the, the, but the discomfort gradually subsides. It's working. His therapist continues this treatment until Jay's fear response is eliminated. So you can even notice here that they called the fear a response. And that's the terminology that's used in conditioning. So everything's adding up about right. The very last paragraph says, people who are subjective to traumatic events such as Jay's incident on the subway sometimes report that they have a very vivid, emotional, and lasting memory of all the details surrounding the experience. A researcher surveyed 100 people about events that they had experienced within the last year. On the emotional scale, a measure of participants' emotional state, the participants rated their emotional experience during each event on a scale ranging from negative 10, which is very bad, to positive 10. Uh, which is extremely positive, okay? So, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll highlight it just in case we need it, I guess. On the confidence scale, a measure of the participant's memory. Okay, so this is weird. So we have been talking about emotional experience, and that's probably the main basic science that we're dealing with here, besides conditioning. So we're dealing with emotions and conditioning. We know that they're going to test us on those two things because that's what the MCAT does. They introduce weird stuff in a passage just for the goal of testing on either your basic science knowledge or your reading comprehension. And so if they bring up a science, they're probably going to test on it. So they brought up emotion, but now they're hitting a pivot and they're going to memory. On the confidence scale, a measure of the participant's memory, the participants indicated how confident they were regarding the accuracy of each memory on a scale range from zero, which is not at all confident, to 10, which is highly confident. The researchers hypothesized that participants experiencing very negative emotions during an event would report higher confidence in their memory. So that's that's really the only relationship that they gave us right there, and that is um, negative emotions, so negative emo, decreased emotional ranking leads to increased memory score. I know I can't write very well, but that says memory. And then the very end is just saying that, th that this relationship is in contrast to a positive emotion. So it, the, the memory goes up relative to the memory of a positive experience. Okay, so we're just talking about conditioning. We've got this one relationship, a little bit of exposure therapy, which is not really that big of a deal in the MCAT. It's not tested frequently, but I just had a lecture on it in med school. So I thought I'd write it down. So let's go ahead and knock out these questions. The first one says, Jay's fear of confined spaces results from what? Well, remember, we talked about Jay feeling very uncomfortable when he was confined, and we said that that was conditioning. And so what Jay is doing here is he's saying that every confined space is now that subway car. He feels like he's in that subway car all over again. So the question is asking, what has Jay, which of these answer choices 
defines an individual taking an old experience with intense like emotional trauma and applying it to newer experiences that are similar in nature. Ace stimulus discrimination. No, that's being able to, to pick the two scenarios apart. So maybe not A. B says stimulus gener generalization, which is exactly what we're looking for. So I'll say maybe to B. I kind of like B. C says second order conditioning, which is actually referencing uh, things like like within classical conditioning with like Pavlov's dogs. Instead of the, the bell would be your first order conditioning and like the can opening or like the pantry opening would be the second order conditioning. It's something that is related to the direct stimulus, but it's not the direct conditioner because that would be the primary order conditioning. D says spontaneous recovery. That's after you have extinguished a conditioned behavior and you like automatically relearn it sometimes whenever you're in a certain situation. Um, and so C and D are not correct. And that means B is your right answer. That was pretty easy. That was pretty much just like straight up basic sciences. This next one says, which of J's responses is most likely to be an unconditioned response? Okay, so let's review the four basic parts of classical conditioning. So you've got the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response. And so the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response are the normal stimulus and response that, a happen, that happens before conditioning occurs. So here, the unconditioned stimulus would be the subway breaking down and all the lights going off and everybody yelling. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of the unconditioned response. So we'll just call it you know, the commotion. The unconditioned response is what Jay felt in response to that stimulus, okay? And that's going to be his sweating. Um, but we're just gonna call this panic. Okay, the conditioned stimulus is now what Jay has been conditioned to associate with that panic or with the unconditioned response. And that's going to end up being like confined spaces. So now this is the problem, right? Like it's not it's not weird to have these. These are normal. These are good. But whenever you start saying that every time that I'm in a small bathroom, now I'm basically in a subway, that's when it becomes a problem. So the conditioned stimulus is confined spaces, and the conditioned response is going to be the same as the unconditioned response. It's panic. So you have the unconditioned stimulus, and you have the conditioned stimulus, and you have the response, which is the same for both of them. And whether it's unconditioned or conditioned, it just depends on what's causing it. And so the unconditioned stimulus this is fine, that's okay for it to cause that response. But the conditioned stimulus, this is when it's weird. Even though it's the same response, it's just at an inappropriate time. So now the question is asking which of these is the unconditioned response? And it's going to be some form or fashion of panic. So A says intense panic, okay, that checks the bill. In an elevator. In an elevator, that would be the conditioned response, right? Because it's coming from a conditioned stimulus of a small space. So maybe not to A. B says physiological arousal in confined spaces. That's the exact same thing as A. Some kind of like heightened emotions or heightened panic or arousal whenever you are in the conditioned stimulus. So maybe not to B. C says emotional arousal during the commotion. So we've got, we can check here because it's the correct response. Uh, some kind of heightened emotions. And then we can check here because during the commotion, that is when the elevator slammed to a halt and that's going to be describing the unconditioned stimulus. So I like C. D says vivid memory of the event. That doesn't check out for any of them. So maybe not D, the correct answer here would be C. This next one says, based on the hypothesis of the study, the researcher most likely expects which finding. Okay, so let's go back and read the hypothesis of the study. It usually is closer to the end and it says it right here. So they think that having more negative emotions leads to higher memory. And that's what we wrote down as our only relationship. I'm looking for something that says more negative events leads to higher memory retention or vice versa. A says a positive correlation between the participant's scores and the confidence scale. So that's referencing memory. So increased memory, and the number of events they recall from the last year. We actually didn't talk about the number of events that they recall from the last year. That wasn't in the hypothesis, so I don't really like A at all. Kind of hate it. So maybe not A. B says a positive correlation between the participant score on the emotion scale, ding, we like emotions, and their scores on the confidence scale. Well, that would mean that as emotions went up and got happier, then memory went up and got better. That's not what we see here, right? We see this negative correlation here. So maybe not to B. Um, C is 
comparing confidence scale and number of events from a recall from last year. So maybe not C because it's the same reason we ruled out A, right? They're comparing the wrong things. And then D is comparing the correct things, emotions and scores on confidence scale, but it has a negative correlation. So it says, as emotions go down, confidence scale goes up and vice versa. And that's exactly what our hypothesis was. So D is the correct answer here. And then these last two are very sciencey. Um, which means they should be easy if you've done your flashcards, but if you haven't, then they might be a little bit difficult. So let's go through these. This one says inc increase in the activity of which branch of the nervous system is directly involved in Jay's physiological symptoms in confined spaces. Okay. This is saying what part of the nervous system is making Jay freak out and panic. One of the acronyms that has stuck with me the longest through all of my education is the idea that sympathetic is fight or flight and parasympathetic is rest and digest. I still think about this, even though this is imperfect, it's really, really good for something like the MCAT where you just need to have the basics down. So if this is making this guy like freak out and sweat and panic, which of these two systems are we probably dealing with? We should be looking for sympathetic. Right. So let's go through these answer choices. A says the parasympathetic. No, he is not resting, nor is he digesting. He is perspiring. So maybe not A. B says the central nerve system. That's like your brain and your spinal cord. I mean, I guess you could argue it that, you know, there's some cognitive processes going on or even like some, some subconscious processes going on, like your brain stem and stuff making you freak out and sweat. Um, so we'll leave in B. Uh, C says, C says the somatic nervous system. That's referencing uh, like voluntary motor. Um, so no, maybe not C is not his, what, what he's doing. You don't like, you're not like, all right, I'm going to sweat. And then you start sweating. Like that's not how it works. Um, it's not voluntary motor. So maybe not C. And then D says sympathetic nervous system. So you're between B and D now thinking, oh, well, they both, they're both active in it. But let's really think about the question. It says an increase in which of the fall in activity of which of the following your central nervous system doesn't like super turn on or turn off, right? It's with the exception of like sleep, you still have a similar level of activity. It's just, is that activity more focused on the parasympathetic end or the sympathetic end? So I wouldn't say that the CNS increases in activity, um, but the sympathetic nervous system definitely increases in activity here. So, Keep in mind, even though you could make an argument for B, you know that D is correct here. So always, always, always go with what you know. D is the correct answer here. And this very last one says levels of which hormone is most likely to reach higher levels as a part of J's conditioned response. Okay, so what's his conditioned response? Uh, we go back and it is panic. So I'm going to rephrase this question as which of these hormones would be associated with panic or stress or freaking out or anything like that? A says oxytocin. For the MCAT, all you have to know oxytocin pretty much for is that it helps with like uterine contractions and emotional regulation. None of those sound like what Jay is having, hopefully. Um, so maybe not A. B says melatonin. That's just the circadian rhythm sleep wake cycle. So maybe not B. C is leptin. Leptin deals with like satiety, gets released from your fat cells and, and makes you feel full. So maybe not to C because that's not what Jay's dealing with either. And then D says cortisol. And it's just frequently known as like your stress hormone. Um, and it is what gets released in response to stress. So you probably expect higher levels of cortisol because Jay's stressed out, man. And so we go with answer choice D here. Thanks for watching the video. This was a quick one, nice and easy, but you cannot miss these, right? Because these are gimme points. And you need every point that you can. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next one.